You only got five minutes. Yeah, but then, like, how long is there after that for questions? Uh, so if you all are doing five minutes, then you will have around 20 minutes. Okay. Just trying to get a game. All right. We are waiting for a presenter, but if you can get seated. All right, my name is uh, Kumar Navalor, uh, Kumar from Maxar, Jim, just let you know, Kumar from Maxar, good rhyme to it. Um, so this is a, a session number two, uh, analytics and representation. Uh, what we'll do is uh, we will kick off with a keynote address from Professor Gill, and then uh, we will have a panel session. We have four uh, speakers who are gonna talk about different aspects of this data. My personal experience uh, when I did my PhD I spend 90% of my time curating the data and 10% on analysis. Here it says 70, 30. I still think those numbers are somewhere around there. So it's about data representation, data creation, and our speakers are going to cover the various aspects of that value chain. Uh, with that, I'm gonna ask Professor Gill to come in, the, give, us, give her a keynote. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, my research is in artificial intelligence and I'm always interested in connecting with new communities and I've already made several connections that are very exciting. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, I thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, George asked me not to talk about AI. So I won't talk about AI, but what else am I going to talk about? What else am I going to talk about? That's what I know about. So I will tell you about... <laughs> exciting things that we are doing that have AI at the core and that are significantly improving our ability to do data science, that 80-20 proportion of time that you spend uh, focusing on the data and so on. So I call this knowledge power data science, and this is something that we teach at USC. Uh, this is the slide that summarizes my message um, my message is um, knowledge power data science is extremely important. Um, I see a shift uh, that, that moves from a focus on data to the focus on models. I was talking with someone from the White House, OSTP. They have Kelvin Drogermeyer and Lynn Parker, eminent scientists directing the office. And they are very worried about how do we describe models? We derive models from data all the time. How do we describe the limitations of the models, the assumptions of the models, when do the models need to be updated? Uh, the entire government is being flooded with models. How do we think about models? And so this is a very big shift. And so I'm interested in these problems of characterizing, reusing, and integrating these models. And I'll talk a, a, a big deal about that today. And I think if, if you look at models and how you harness data to develop useful models for decision making, you have to incorporate um, a lot of science knowledge about these models and the data that they use. And it's knowledge about physical, geological, chemical, biological, ecological, uh, social, economic uh, factors, and also uh, knowledge about what a user might want to do with that model. So I'll talk about these topics more, but infusing into our systems more information and more knowledge about um, these models. And this will enable new forms of reasoning, integration, visualization, management, learning, and discovery with geosciences data uh, at large. I have um, a very big focus on geoscience modeling, but I think that these ideas and these trends apply generally. So that's my message. Um, models are extremely important, and in order to harness the power of models, we need to bring in this knowledge power to data science. 
Um, I think what George saw is a paper that we had on intelligence systems for geosciences really calling to infusing more knowledge um, uh, coming from AI, knowledge representation, planning, workflows, etc., into geosciences. So that paper is available if you're curious about that side. So I'll motivate this need for knowledge in data science uh, by talking about integrated modeling. That's something that I think about quite a bit. And then I'll talk about why the models are so different across disciplines and why all of this knowledge will help us bridge along the way. Uh, I'll talk about work that we've been doing in Mint, and I'll show you examples of the kinds of knowledge that we're capturing and using to improve uh, the time to results uh, from the time from a problem. Uh, formulation. And then I'll finish talking about uh, this broader picture of intelligence systems and AI for geosciences. So if you, if you try to understand how natural systems, uh, climate, uh, hydrology, interact with human systems, the people that do the planting and the harvesting, human migration, um, uh, industrialization, the growth of urban systems. If you try to understand things at these, uh, 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 in this uh, sphere, you need to integrate models from different disciplines that model different types of processes. And so I have examples here. We have a strong collaboration with UT Austin. They have a project called Planet Texas 2050 that looks at how can the state sustain the growth in population. So how do they manage groundwater resources? How do they manage the industrial need for water, agricultural needs for water? And they have a lot of connections also through the Rio Grande with Mexico. Um, and so they need to be able to understand how to make it a sustainable plan for the state. Um, for, for 2050, that's their focus. So we work a lot with them in terms of uh, creating integrated models. Uh, at the bottom, I have a map of California. Uh, there's a mandate to have a plan to manage groundwater resources across the state, and USGS just cannot generate models of those groundwater resources fast enough, and there's very few people that can actually do this and, and harness data and run the models. So. Uh, modeling is always a bottleneck in terms of data preparation, data harnessing, and so on. Um, we work a lot also with um, South Saharan Africa. I'll talk more about this uh, project, but the effects of um, climate dynamics, droughts and flooding and, and the, the general um, weather uh, forecasting and how that affects the ability to um, uh, have food accessibility and availability. Uh, there's a lot of human migration in the region and so we look at the intersection and the connections between all of these different natural and human aspects of that. Uh, and I think at the bottom right, I have uh, examples from the Mekong River where uh, there's a lot of implications across the entire river for different regions, different countries. Uh, there's fisheries involved. There's many different aspects and a lot more disciplines than I've been mentioning so far uh, and a lot more administrative regions. It's, it's virtually impossible to create a comprehensive model that, that looks at all of these perspectives. So, so, so a grand challenge, I think, for geospatial uh, data science is integrated modeling. And you think about agriculture models, economic models, social models, natural models, and also models of the infrastructure uh, that deliver some resources. There's increased demand for these. Um, I think there always has been great demand, but there's always been this human bottleneck of manually setting up and integrating these models. Um, it takes months or years to put together um, uh, models for these uh, kinds of problems. And it's really a craft. Very few people understand how to do this. And so it's very hard to integrate a pair of two natural models. My first attempt at this was between uh, limnology and hydrology, so lakes and river models, and realizing that those communities never talk to each other. They have entirely different views on the characteristics and the behavior of the water flow. And so uh, really, really hard to integrate models across different disciplines, even those are both physical, natural models. Imagine if you try to integrate great socioeconomic models with agricultural models. So this is a very, very um, uh, huge uh, problem, a grand challenge, because there's so much demand for it. I think we'll have a better world if we manage to do this integrated modeling. And if we can do integrated modeling,
modeling well, then we can do many other things really well. We can do data preparation really well. We can do single model reuse really well, et cetera. So why is this so hard? Um, models are complex, uh, but when you talk about models across disciplines, they are very, very different. So I'll give you a flavor of, of the challenges. So you look at hydrology models, they're looking at um, building maybe an irregular grid where they can look at physical variables in each one of those grid cells. There's a lot of physics involved. Uh, the complexity can be enormous, but the system can also be simplified and modeled at a, at a uh, coarser grain level. Uh, it needs a lot of data, historical data, to adapt the general physics and fluid equations to that particular area. Uh, but it generates very useful information about the times and days where particular uh, grid cells are flooded. So they're very important, uh, but they have this flavor of very rich physics-based uh, modeling. In contrast, agriculture models tend to be more focused on uh, biophysical processes, so the growth of the plants, weeding practices, different crops behave differently. A lot of these models um, look at different um, uh, versions of the crops, so not all maize is maize. There's many different uh, genetic variants, and so, um, so they look at all of these biogeophysical processes. So this is not so much the physics, but their processes that are dynamic, and they look at the, the race of this variable if there's less weeds, for example. So how do the different variables relate? Very different processes. Um, Social models tend to look at um, uh, societal behaviors through agent-based modeling where you have uh, different groups of agents doing certain behaviors. So you can define groups of agents that have children and the children will go to school. And so they're able to do the farming or something else. And so you define all of these behaviors and you can see the dynamics of how the system evolves and behaves over time. So if you're trying to understand and, and integrate two of these models, they work at such different scales, they have such different methodologies, some of them are uh, very based on theory, some of them are very empirical, um, some of them are um, modeling variables that are very, very different in the physical world. Um, some of them, the more data and the more types of data that you have, they do a better job, but there's not so much data availability. Um, and the, the ways in which you integrate two models uh, from um, that both look at physics is very different from the way that you would integrate with a social uh, model. So the challenges are many. And what I want to emphasize and talk about today is the ability to bring knowledge that we have as humans when we do this by hand, taking years to do, uh, and how can we incorporate this knowledge into our data science systems to improve the way that we do it. So the diversity, uh, we actually organize in several levels, and I will describe um, each of those levels in turn, from problem framing to selecting the right models to mapping variables across the models and to bring in the data that the models need. Um, there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of runtime coordination across models and model coupling, et cetera. That's a whole another bowl of beans. Now I have a very colorful graphic on the right if you're interested. It, but I won't cover that. I will focus more on the, this knowledge, power, data, science ideas. Uh, why is this so hard? So you frame the modeling problem. Well, what variables should I consider? What models are available? So there's a whole back and forth. You may go down a path and then come back to reframing your problem differently. Uh, the scope of the modeling problem can be very, very different, but this is all done manually. So when a modeler comes in, they don't really know what's available to them and, and how to think of the problem and what can be simulated and run. Uh, the model selection, uh, there's model catalogs, they describe what the models do, sometimes you can run them, uh, sometimes you can couple models if they're very similar, very close, but typically you'll read through documentation and you'll do a manual selection of your models. Uh, there's lots of tools out there, they're not necessarily well integrated, um, uh, and so there's a lot of passing data from tool to tool, et cetera. So very manual process as well. Then models can talk about different variables. So for example, a hydrology model is very different from a, 
an agriculture model in many ways, but one way is that a hydrology model looks at a grid of data. The agriculture model is a point model. There's one point for that entire area that has corn plants. And so just being able to transfer things about soil moisture and other kinds of information is very hard. So the mapping of the variables happens mostly by hand and through manually crafted data transformations. And then finally, the models are very thirsty for data. So the creation and the ingestion and the integration of data, uh, there's lots of tools as well, but they tend to be disconnected and you try to find the ones that help you do whether it is regridding or something else. So, so we, we can do a lot better in all of these um, aspects. So I will talk about work that we're doing towards this, because if I tell you just words and I don't give you any concrete examples, then um, it's a lot less helpful. So I will show you examples from the work that we've been doing. So how do we use knowledge in all of these pieces of the problem, uh, from framing to, to model selection to variable mapping and data ingestion? The project that we have is called MINT. It's a DARPA-funded project. It's a pretty large project. We're focused on South Saharan Africa. We also work with the Gates Foundation. And it's very exciting because we have modeling experts, we have data experts, we have workflow experts, we have high computing experts, et cetera, all looking at this problem of of uh, facilitating the model integration. So going uh, through this pyramid, I will start first with uh, the bottom uh, aspect of this. So imagine we've picked our model, we know what kind of uh, variables and data it needs. Let's see how we deal with data ingestion. So, so knowledge guided information extraction and integration. So one of the things that we discover very quickly is that, for example, in a region like Ethiopia or South Sudan, um, if they have gauges in the rivers, uh, historical data, they don't have a lot of years and they don't have a lot of gauges. So we're looking at creating digital gauges that come from satellite data, remote observation. And what's very interesting is that a lot of the things that you can learn through machine learning, um, they do a combination of supervised and unsupervised models. This is work of Vipin Kumar and his group at Minnesota. And um, you know, they, can, they can extract information about um, uh, land use and what kind of crops grow in different areas. Um, they've created this concept of virtual gauges for the river so they can tell the depth and the width of the rivers. And what's most interesting is that they have figured out a way to incorporate uh, knowledge about physics that constrains what the machine learning models uh, learn. So I'll give you very quickly an example where uh, part of uh, training uh, these uh, neural networks um, uh, is to incorporate knowledge about physical constraints. So this is an example from um, uh, looking at uh, lake... Uh, I think lake temperature. And so they start to look at um, the data that they have at different layers in the lake, at different depths in the lake. And the, the neural network does learn a very good model, but there are some places where you'll go from very warm temperature to cold to warm again that don't make a lot of sense. And so they incorporated knowledge about what is the, um, I think you can see it on the right. Uh, so for example, uh, the the uh, depth uh, versus temperature and then other en energy conservation laws. And so what you see at the bottom is what the machine learning method learns versus what a physics-based mo lake model learns. And they're very, very close together, but the machine learning model is really learning from the data and some of the laws that the um, the lake model does. So the machine learning model is much cheaper to develop as long as you see that what it's learning is consistent physically with what's going on in the lake. So this is an example of where using knowledge about physics and knowledge about the world guides the machine learning method to do better. Very exciting work. Also in terms of data preparation and data um, um, uh, management, um, let me go to the next slide first. We're doing a lot of work on using uh, probabilistic models to learn what uh, tabular data contains. And so tabular data tends to have a lot of structure. You will say this is data from uh, country A, this is data from country B, and then all the rows and columns are organized in certain ways. And so there's a lot of structure within them. How can we discover that structure and tease out the content of uh, those data tables? So we've done some great work where um, extracting metadata, the very 
variables used on those tables, creating uh, semantic representations of those tables can be done mostly automatically. Um, there's human intervention, of course, but it can done, be done mostly automatically. Uh, once we have descriptions of these tables, we can say, okay, this model ingests uh, data in this uh, format. Uh, the data is available in this format. So we've been working on automatically transforming data from one format to another. So we use um, AI planning techniques, but if we know the initial state and the end state, we know that we'll have to go through some set of actions to do those transformations. So we're including a lot of the transformations that are typical of modeling into our architecture uh, to be able to do this. So that's this layer of data ingestion, ingesting knowledge of um, uh, physics into machine learning models from data, and then also ingesting semantic models of data that are automatically or mostly automatically created by the system. The next layer that I'll talk about is mapping variables and understanding modeling variables. So the work that we're building on is by Scott Peckham and others at University of Colorado, uh, looking at what can we possibly measure in a physical system and organizing and describing the patterns that we typically use to describe variables. So uh, there's objects that you're measuring uh, things about. There's processes that involve those objects. It's very important to understand what process you're trying to uh, get to and you're trying to measure. The processes, you can observe certain quantities about them. The state also have has uh, quantities about it, and there's properties about that object that you may also want to observe or measure in some way. Uh, we've also discovered that in order to connect modeling to decision making, you want to uh, be able to have indices and define indices that tell you something interesting about the system. So for example, a drought index, index tells you a lot more about what's happening in a region than the raw um, object properties in that region. So we're building on this way of uh, defining uh, variables, physical variables using patterns. And so in our system, if you include a model or if you include a data set, uh, we're always trying to map uh, when it says, you know, channel depth into some particular combination of patterns that's describing the object, which is the channel and its properties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is fantastic work that is very, very helpful. Uh, let me move to how we select models and how we describe models. This is very, very new work on using semantic descriptions of models. Uh, we've done a lot of work on describing machine learning models um, dating back to the year 2000 and before. If you're interested in that particular aspect, I'd be happy to talk to you about this. Uh, also describing software and describing um, uh, data transformations and other kinds of uh, software. I'm going to focus here on, uh, on describing models models that are these dynamic simulation-based models, um, and uh, how I'll focus on six particular aspects of these models that are very important for us to capture uh, knowledge about. Uh, so the first one is model invocation. So we say, uh, here's a big software package, for example, ModFlow from USGS. It has many versions, many different processes that it could model for groundwater. So here's a particular configuration with seven select processes. There's no snow melt because in this particular configuration, we're not going to worry about that. So we won't need that kind of data, et cetera. And then we'll do setups and calibrations for different flavors of problems or different uh, regions or areas. And so how to invoke the model, how to map this, this majestic piece of software into specific ways to invoke it and use it in a consistent way is uh, one of the first steps that we follow. Uh, the next thing that we look at is the data formats. So this you probably all know very much about, um, and uh, we try to characterize not just the major data sources, or so weather data sources, et cetera, but every model will use um, uh, specific uh, kinds of data that we try to describe and standardize properly. Uh, the model variables are also very important. So just saying that you use a NetCDF format is fantastic, but we want to understand exactly what variables are used. And so I showed you before the example of how we use these ontologies and patterns to describe variables, but we also describe you know, the units, the, the particular um, boundaries and types of values that they take, et cetera. 
uh, we also describe constraints and preconditions. So a lot of the models will say, uh, you know, I need daily rainfall data versus monthly rainfall data. These things turn out to be important. But if you're combining a hydrology and agriculture model, they need to be using the same data. So we want to capture these constraints that are not specific to one model, but that bridge across different models. Uh, number five is very, very important and you don't normally see in models, which is what are the drivers that I can uh, use to do forecasting of different scenarios and what are the parameters that an end user or a decision maker or a modeler may want to adjust in this model. And so we put a lot of care into describing uh, how to adjust parameters in a model and make it very use very simple to do so. Um, and also what driving uh, uh, data we can use. Related to these parameters, we also tease out potential interventions. So here's an example where uh, in an agriculture model, if we change the planting windows, if you, we do an intervention that says we're going to plant on these dates at the earliest, then that might be a way to avoid uh, the drought with more likelihood. Or if we plant earlier, we might avoid the flooding while the, um, you know, th that may happen before the harvest or weed control and management practices and so on. So any potential interventions are mapped to the model uh, specifically. So this is a flavor of the kinds of knowledge and the kinds of information that we find are very, very necessary in order for the tools to understand how a model fits and how to use it and save ourselves all of these manual um, configuration and setup of the model. Uh, the final thing that I will mention is on problem framing. So depending on the, the framing of the problem, you will select different models, you will have need for different kinds of data. So we want to understand the problem framing. framing. Uh, it's kind of a negotiation. So I'll frame a problem if I have this data. If I don't have the data, then I won't bother to frame the problem this way. So it's very important for users to be able to explore what's there in the system. So we're using kind of a general decision-making um, process framework and the modeling sits in the middle Middle, and we're simply trying to see how much of that bigger context we need to incorporate. Uh, so for the moment, we're allowing users to state their problem, uh, to create tasks that tie response variables with driving variables. What, is, what are the variables that you're interested in varying and seeing the response to? Uh, what kinds of interventions you're interested in? So we'll uh, weed out and we'll show what models and what data are required for each one of these. So the users can explore different paths uh, throughout the system. So they can do forecasting, they can look at interventions, but all of this information that I've uh, showed you is extremely useful to make the actual uh, going through the modeling exercises pretty fast. Uh, so just last week, we had uh, a, a DARPA evaluation with several users uh, uh, that are uh, third-party users uh, running through a lot of different uh, problems uh, through Mint. Uh, they identify what results they're interested in. They look at what relevant models are shown to them. And very quickly, they're able to find uh, the system transforms the data for them. And they're able to set up and run models um, pretty easily. So uh, with two hours of training, they were able to actually use this and, and come to their uh, solve some uh, challenging modeling problems. Uh, so we're very interested in tying, now that we understand all these variables that the models look at, in tying the different variables into causal models, in understanding how to do different kinds of forecasting interventions that uh, will also require the forecasting and quantifying uncertainty. This is a big topic in modeling, but uh, certainly very important here. So my summary of all these things that I've uh, told you about Mint is that we are using a lot of knowledge to enable this more uh, assisted data science, this more automated and less manual kinds of data science. So three highlights uh, to use knowledge guided machine learning. How can you use machine learning systems that will take in knowledge that you know to be the case for a domain? in our case, physics, for example, uh, knowledge-rich catalogs of data and models. 
Uh, so I showed you how we use uh, probabilistic models to automatically extract metadata from uh, tabular data. Uh, I've shown you what kinds of information we uh, keep about models and we reason with. And then the third piece is this um, knowledge-driven problem framing. So understanding what are the indicators and the variables of interest to a user and how those map to the variables in different models. So I want to kind of come back and conclude by talking more generally about how all of this knowledge can create more intelligent systems for modeling and for geosciences in general. This is the article that I mentioned at the beginning. So if now you are more interested, uh, please uh, visit us. It came out of, a, of an NSF workshop on intelligent systems for geosciences, but it is a very active network. So if you go to is-geo.org, you will find a lot of people that are similarly minded about how do we build these knowledge power data science tools for modeling. Uh, in this article, you will see a lot of really exciting ideas about opportunities across the scales uh, that all of this knowledge can bring to bear. So uh, workspaces where you have um, more interactive model building, more support for model building, uh, the ability to specify high level questions, uh, theory guided learning, so machine learning that incorporates knowledge of different kinds, uh, the idea of trusted threads where someone doesn't just hand you uh, a graphic or, an, or a visualization, but actually you have access to the entire thread that generated it. Uh, and then uh, on model-driven sensing, I haven't talked very much about this, but it's really the idea that the more that you understand what data your models need and at what granularity and where your priorities are, uh, the better you can guide um, expensive sensing, for example. Um, I've talked about the project at the bottom center called Mint, but we have a lot of ongoing projects about infusing knowledge and better representations throughout different aspects of science. So whether it is the software, the collaborations, the workflows, the provenance, um, and uh, of course the data. We've done a lot of work on crowdsourcing vocabularies. Uh, we have a project on doing automating discovery with AI. Uh, we have a meeting at the Turing Institute, a worldwide meeting on how could AI make discoveries worth of a Nobel Prize. Um, so I think there's a lot of automation that we can move towards. Um, so, so if you're interested in these topics, I, I, I heard this morning questions about uh, linked data and, and semantic web. Uh, everything that we create are URLs and web objects. So if you want to see what model we're using, what software we're using, everything is URIs and they're interconnected. So you see a visualization and you follow all these URIs to, to uh, see where it came from. Uh, the provenance being very important. So um, I'm a very big fan of infusing a lot of knowledge throughout all the objects that we have and have them really better interconnected. So I will conclude uh, putting back the first slide that I showed you, my message, my, my um, big conclusion is the same that I started with. Uh, so I see a shift from data to models, trying to understand models, characterize them better, reuse them, integrate them. Uh, I think we need to incorporate more science knowledge into how we think about models and data. Uh, so this is knowledge about all sorts of aspects of science and also knowledge about the user's goals and context. What do they want to see? What do they want to do? How do we link all these models to, to things that users care about? And through, through all of this knowledge, I think data science will see a new generation of tools and uh, infrastructure to really support better uh, reasoning, better integration, better visualization, uh, learning and discovery. Um, I mentioned the isgeo.org site. And um, my last slide is a pointer to a 20-year roadmap for AI that I just um, uh, co-chaired. It's uh, public. Um, and it looks at 20 years out, what do we need uh, to accelerate science? What do we need to accelerate research? What do we need in terms of uh, infrastructure to support uh, AI technologies and AI research? Uh, so if you're curious about this, I know there's a section following up on AI, but I thought I would talk about AI anyway, <laughs> if there's interest. And uh, I'll conclude there and take questions.
or we have time for maybe two, three questions. I'll open it, open it up. On your future work slide, you listed uncertainty. Can you give us a motivating use case on why that's important for your future work? Yes, so in a lot of ways, um, you know, we can generate a lot of flood maps. We can generate a lot of predictions about flooding that look at, you know, what if there's 10% more rainfall than in previous years, et cetera, et cetera. What a decision maker wants to really understand is how likely it is that this flooding will occur. Uh, in fact. And so to do that, we need to do a lot of uh, different model runs, consider different models as well. So the uncertainty comes from the data that we have to start with the forecast that we start with, uh, being able to see if many models tell us that the same kind of flooding or similar flooding is predicted. Uh, so uh, I'm not a scientist, but I understand the uncertainty comes from many different sources. And uh, right. certainly the decision makers want to to hear about this and see about this and get a sense of that. Right. Okay. So I'm for, certainly familiar with the sources of uncertainty and all that kind of stuff. I'm really interested in the decision makers who are banging on the table to say, I need to understand the uncertainty in these predictions. I mean, do you really have examples of those? Um, so a lot of reasons is because we're considering the interventions, as I mentioned, right? So if you're going to uh, spend quite a bit of money and effort into a particular intervention, you really want to make sure that that's a likely scenario. And so that's the main source of, of the demand for uncertainty. Any other questions? I do have a question for you. Uh, in terms of data and knowledge, you were using those two. How do you separate those two? Uh, how do you represent, I think I know how rep data is represented, how do you represent knowledge? Uh, so the, um, I don't know if I know knowledge when I see it. I certainly know data when I see it. Um, I think what I mean by knowledge is uh, uh, symbolic representations, probabilistic representations that uh, speak to a conceptual understanding of a system and that you can uh, link together to create new knowledge. And so I'm thinking about concepts, I'm thinking about inference, I'm thinking about uh, laws, I'm thinking about you know, a different layer. Uh, the data is more linked to observations or predictions, but it, it won't tell me that um, knowledge-based understanding or knowledge-level description of how the system behaves. Any other questions? Very, very <laughs> I'm sorry. Is this on? Oh, okay. Um, so, <laughs> some models um, are proprietary and black boxes, uh, and we, you know, we don't know the, the inner workings of them. Could you address that issue with your uh, Bint framework? So, um, yeah, so we looked very extensively at, at this. Uh, the, the area that has us more worried are the, the social and economic models. Uh, there's uh, a lot more models in the physical, natural realm um, that are public, that are open. They have their own problems. Uh, they're buggy. There may be three people that know how to fix your bugs. They have a whole host of, an, of other problems. Um, but the proprietary models, particularly in, in, inf in uh, infrastructure and um, uh, socioeconomic modeling, uh, it's a very grave situation. So I'm not an economist, uh, but I've talked to a lot of economists, and there's very little of this concept of model reuse. So you take a hydrology model and you use it for Ethiopia or you use it for Pennsylvania, and it's the same set of physical laws and principles and the same software that you're bringing to bear. In economics, this is what I'm told, 
you know, if you've published a model, why would you use it for a different problem, right? Then you don't have a paper. You, it's not modeling, right? So, so we're, we're uh, trying, but it's not very easy to develop economic models that do capture basic market principles that we can reuse across different areas. Uh, but that's a challenging area in itself. Um, I will tell you that a lot of models are open and in principle accessible. So, for example, in the DOE labs, there's a lot of models about infrastructure um, that in principle are accessible and open to us. But if there's two people that understand how to use them and it takes them two months to set them up, uh, it's not a very, um, you know, uh, they might as well, as well be closed. So, so yeah, this is a, a huge challenge. Uh, please join me in thanking Professor. Thank you. So uh, I would like to invite panelists to join me on the stage. Before I forget, I would like to thank uh, Annie, who is our uh, rapporteur. So if she makes any mistakes, blame her, not me. Um, so uh, I'm looking for Todd. Todd, are you here? OK, awesome. So we have a little change. Uh, we lost one of our speakers. So uh, we have a new speaker, and they'll all introduce themselves. So uh, what I'll do is uh, I will hand it over. Uh, each of the speakers will have approximately five minutes to present. And then at the end, we'll take the Q&A, if that's OK. So Lauren, you want to go first? HDMI. There we go. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Lauren Bennett. I I work at Esri. Um, I lead up our spatial analysis and geoprocessing software development team. So we build the framework for doing spatial analysis within RG the RGS platform. Um, I think what I want to talk about follows up what Dr. Gill showed really beautifully um, because I am similarly passionate about the idea that a model sitting somewhere where three people know how to use it is has minimal use um, and is disappointingly, I mean, it's, in, it's very useful, but not actually in practice. So, um, kind of I pose this question, and I'm going to stay very high level because I want to make sure we actually have time to kind of have a discussion. But, you know, to me, the question is, will data science and specifically spatial data science live up to its promise? I don't think it, certainly don't think it has yet. Um, and I think that it's really important. It's not just about the algorithms, right? It's, the algorithms are very, very important. And, um, I'm really glad there's lots of people working on them, and certainly we've got some folks that are passionately focused on building algorithms. <laughs> um, but for me, especially when I think about building software that hundreds of thousands of, of people use, the minute we, we put it out there, I think about how important it is for it to be able to be applied to a wide range of problems that we find you know, we focus a lot on finding those things that are out there that can be broadly applied um, and aren't maybe quite as niche. Um, that's certainly where, where we spend our time. Um, also really important that they can be explained to a, a decision maker um, so that they can really make an educated um, decision about what that knowledge really means. Um, and that's increasingly important because um, decision makers are being bombarded with knowledge uh, and being able to to really create things that can be explained is, is critical. And then also that they can be operationalized. And I think that gets at the idea that we need it to be something that many people are able to use and that within an organization, you know, you don't have to hire a, a team of PhD data scientists in order to make use of those models at that at the kind of organizational level. Um, so we spend a large portion of our time trying to make things simple and approachable, um, trying to take 
widely used methods and think about how do we boil this method down into something that pretty much any analyst can understand. Um, you know, every local government, state government, every public health department and public safety um, organization has a GIS analyst or a public health analyst who has a lot of subject matter expertise, but not necessarily a degree in statistics or a degree in, um, you know, operations research. And we're trying to take these things and make them approachable to, to all of those people because a lot of the most important uh, change is going to happen at the local level. And so we have to put the powerful modeling capabilities into the hands of those people that are at that local level. Um, and then finally, a, a lot of our, our time, and, and we think a lot about the idea of, of not just, you know, we build tools that we think will be very broadly applicable because that's kind of our, our, our audience. Um, but of course, those niche models, the things that are, are very specific to a small group of people are still incredibly important. And so it's, it's, we put a lot of thought into the idea that the things that we build have to be really easily integrated and extended because you know, there's no way that the complex problems that any one of our, our users are facing can all exclusively be solved inside of ArcGIS. Um, and so we spend a lot of time thinking about how can we make sure that our users can, you know, make use of the things that we've done to make things simple and approachable, but then also reach out to this broad ecosystem and use R, use the, the stuff that's out there in Python um, to extend and integrate what we've done um, so that they can solve those problems. Essentially find the best possible tool to solve their problem and just use it to solve that problem. And we want to make that really easy for them too. So, I mean... I think that that's at the heart of how the work that we're all doing is going to actually live up to its potential is that we go beyond publishing papers um, and and you know ex building the the really powerful algorithms and we get into getting these things into the hands of people that are going to use them to to drive decisions at that very local level. That's my position. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. I like your slides. Simple. <laughs> Keith, uh, you're next. Thank you. Uh, my name is Keith Herr. Um, I work for a company called JCC Consulting. Um, and we do high performance database systems. But the, the real reason I'm up here is because of um, uh, what I do for fun. And um, a few decades ago, I got involved in the SQL Standards Committee and hung around long enough until I'm actually the convener of the international. Um, committee that uh, creates standards for database languages. Um, for years, we've thought of that as SQL. And recently, we've had a new project I'll talk a little bit about called um, GQL, Property Graph Query Language. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some things not quite as succinct as other speakers. Um, when, when George emailed me about doing this, one of my questions was, how much time do I have? And Basically, I need to represent 30 plus years of standards in five minutes. Um, so I wanted to focus on some, some highlights of things that we've done in the SQL standard. For years in the SQL standards world, we thought of um, anytime new technology comes along, we've integrated it into SQL. So we've added um, online analytical processing capabilities. Uh, we've added temporal capabilities. Most recently, we published a new part uh, that supports multidimensional arrays and as, as column and a table and operations on those arrays. And a lot of this work uh, came out of um, a couple of people in Germany who have been active in um, OGC and TC211. We've also started looking at property graphs. And 
about three years ago, I talked at a location power seminar in Orlando on um, big data. And one of the questions I got was, when are you going to integrate prop, um, graph queries into um, SQL? And that was sort of the first of about three or four other discussions that I had in the next couple of months about um, graphs and property graphs. And we've ended up creating two projects in the standards world. One is a project to integrate property graph queries in um, SQL, we're calling SQL PGQ. The reason for that is that a significant portion of the world's data exists in SQL tables. There's some really interesting analysis capabilities that have been developed in conjunction with property graphs. By giving users the ability to represent the relational data as property graph data, we give them access to those analytical capabilities. We think that's going to be um, um, important, although the presentation doesn't think it will be. <laughs> uh, but what we're really doing there is we're integrating a property graph query language with SQL, but we didn't have a property graph query language standard. So we've now created a project to create a, declared, a standard for a declarative property graph query language that we're calling GQ, GQL. And then it's going to include the ability to represent um, data in property graphs to add, modify, query, delete in a transactional um, context, um, a path language to do all of the, um, the, the, the queries. Wherever possible, we're going to use the SQL specification. Um, um, the, other, the other issue is SQL, traditionally, you have to define the schema up front before you start storing data. It turns out that there are some valid use cases for stick the data in, figure out what the schema really is later. Now you have to be careful with that because you could end up with complete garbage, uh, but we're going to support in the standard the ability to have either an upfront defined schema, which has some distinct advantages, or the ability to be um, schema-less. And I don't know if it'll make it into version one, but eventually we'll have the ability to mix those in so you could have a partial schema. Uh, so, that's the high-level view of this property graph query language. Uh, what are the use cases? Ah, this picture. Um, you can think of the SQL PGQ pro project as really the intersection between GQL and SQL. And so we have these two things going on, and we're working on the intersection as we build the GQL standard. What are the use cases? Uh, a company called Neo4j um, published a, a press release um, back in September after the project was approved, and some guy by the name of George Percival said something about um, the OGC building standards on, um, geospatial standards on GQL. Just a tweet. Um, we have a couple, a couple of other interesting use cases that I don't have time to go into, but this is one of the places where where this kind of technology we think is going to make a lot of sense. Um, we've had a conversation since then, um, and um, one of the WG3 people, a guy by the name of Tobias Lindeker from Sweden, will be at the, um, the meeting next week in, in Toulouse to particularly talk about the GeoSparkle work. What else are we doing? We've been talking about streaming data for a number of years, and we're beginning to make progress on it, although it's not nearly as visible. What we've done isn't as visible or as ready to be visible as the GQL work. The idea is that uh, you want to be able to query the data, apply all of the SQL analytical capabilities to the data uh, before you actually store it, or maybe instead of storing it. Um, you want to do input from zero or more streams output to zero or more streams or tables, and then provide some additional analytical capabilities uh, across that streaming data. Um, looks like some interesting work, um, and I'm looking forward to somebody actually doing more work on it. We've also talked about adding statistical functions to uh, the SQL specification, and the basic idea there is that 
There's a lot of statistical functions that would be useful in data, uh, but they're already defined in textbooks or standard references with the algorithms, and so we don't want to define the reference. We really just want to define um, the, the signatures, how you would call them in SQL, and leave them up to the individual implementation to um, call the appropriate library or to define the appropriate library. Other than that, we're not really doing anything in the standards world. Keith, thank you. Todd, you're up next. Showing up. Ed, I might get your help here. It's not, oh, well, duh. Right, that's the we're power not, problem. Uh, yeah, it's, we're not While we are waiting for this, I'll tell you a joke. I'm an engineer. Huh? Any engineers here? Engineers, we are very precise about everything, right? So, this is a joke we tell at Maxar. A uh, wife asked her engineer husband to go get some eggs. He never came back because he doesn't know how to do some eggs. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Thank you for the uh, the cover here. <laughs> hey guys. Hey, I'm Todd Mostek, co-founder and CEO of OmniSci. Uh, some of you may have formally heard of us as MACD. Um, so we've been around for a while. Um, we kind of focus on the intersection of interactive big data analytics and geospatial and location intelligence. And I just want to quickly talk about you know, what's changing? What's changing in the world of geospatial analytics? Um, there's a lot of things you've heard a lot today. And I just think some of it can be summarized in, in three points here. One is that unlike the old world of GIS, we're moving into a world where we have all these new sensors and devices, phones, IoT data, data coming off of cars, planes, et cetera, power lines, um, satellites. And this proliferation of data is creating the proliferation of these type of data sets from these sensors and devices is creating location data of unprecedented scale and velocity, right? So instead of um, assets that you might measure in the thousands, whether they're power lines or um, you know, real estate properties, these things can be billions or even trillions of data points and they all have a, uh, a time and uh, geo stamp to them. And so I think that's the first thing that people are struggling to deal with. Um, second is I think um, one of the themes here has been that we're seeing a convergence of traditional geospatial analytics, right? With traditional just analytics, uh, what people might call the data warehouse and BI space, um, as well as you know, data science workflows, right? Uh, everything, you know, people talk a lot about data science and how cool it is, but it's really just people trying to solve their problems augmenting the human with the machine. And I think in particular location data is, is very ripe um, for leveraging uh, machines and the power of modern computing and modern hardware uh, to actually give answers that a human couldn't uncover or run models, et cetera. And then finally, um, new use cases, these new use cases demand real time and interactive interrogation of this data, right? So. Um, no longer is a day or running a Spark workload often enough where things might take hours, days, or even weeks. People need real-time answers because they're trying to figure out where there's fire risk if you're a utility. Um, if you're a telco, you're trying to figure out why calls are being dropped. Um, is it related to, can you tweak the cell tower, the, the location or the direction of the antenna? Is it a handset failure, a firmware update? What's causing the issue? And uh, so I think there's a, a need for real-time scalable analytics across geospatial and non-geospatial data alike. And, you know, it just goes a little bit on me, so I won't plug it too much, but, you know, our whole reason for existence is basically to allow people to do scalable analytics using different modes of understanding, uh, SQL queries, visualization, um, and data science workflows um, to allow them to get insight in time spans uh, that they wouldn't be able to otherwise. And so I thought it might be interesting just to walk through a quick workflow um, that we see sometimes in, uh, in the field with our customers. We have, we're open source, uh, open source core. 
the large number of users using our platform for different use cases. So we've been working with uh, a major major federal agency that works with uh, uh, domestic airplane traffic, aircraft traffic. And so one of the things that people are trying to do, for example, is figure out, you know, hey, what's the best route? How can we actually reduce delays um, and optimally route flights, both not only for on-time performance, but also for safety, frankly. How can we make sure that we uh, can dynamically space out these planes, route them around weather, and make sure that they get there on time and in one piece? And so this is an example of our platform. Um, it's 4.5 billion records work running on a workstation. And here we're leveraging not only this fast SQL running on GPUs, it allows us to get millisecond response time. And you know, here I can instantly drill down, click Southwest. I'm rendering all this, all this data is being rendered on the GPU because it's not scalable to send billions of records over the wire. And I'm gonna see the max eight here and we can immediately basically see, you know, when the max eight was grounded, we can zoom in here and say, you know, I'm gonna actually rush over and see Europe basically, it's grounded on the 12th of March, I believe, and then the US grounds on the 13th of March. So one of the things that we've been looking at, which is at the intersection of analytics and data science, is basically this ability to do things that, it's great to be able to see this data, but imagine we wanted to actually visualize, um, you know, the routes between uh, two given airports. So say we wanted to look at, um, Chicago to Boston here. Um, you see here this Jupiter lab icon. One of the things that I can do here is um, what I can do is I can actually now convert to a pandas like workflow and actually take this data and take all the flights that are between ORD and Boston, Logan, and actually bin them. And what I'm doing here is now I'm getting all the spatial bins between these things. This happens in seconds. And now what I can do is I'm pivoting this table into a, it's generating this huge SQL query behind the scenes, this pandas like syntax, that basically is creating 200 columns of the top features, the top spatial bins between these two airports. And then effectively what I'm doing is uh, on the GPU running a GPU accelerated k-means uh, algorithm, which takes seconds. I'm not gonna step through the whole thing here. And then finally load it back into the database. And now I actually can look at um, these flights here and you know, showing them uh, clustered here. So I can actually see the trajectories and the next step would see, be to say, hey, what are the trajectories of what are the flight paths that actually lead to the best on time performance? So you can see, I can just go in and add it. And now I can visualize um, some of these different trajectories. This is just a quick demo of what you can do. And I think this shows the example of kind of analytics, data science, and location intelligence converging, happening at scale in real time, and the things that you can solve for with these types of capabilities. So we have a last minute change. Uh, Richard, uh, sorry, Robert from uh, UC Davis couldn't make it. Hamid from uh, Radiant.Earth. Uh, stepped in, so thank you, Hamid. Floor is all yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hamid al Mohammed. I'm the Chief Data Scientist with Radiant Earth Foundation. I'm not gonna talk about R, sorry, I'm not an expert in R. <laughs> so, but I'm gonna talk about training data and a little bit uh, maybe Python later on. But before uh, going to that, I wanna share an experience from my PhD time, uh, how I'm thinking about the user dealing with data uh, and particularly cloud versus an FTP server. So I started my PhD about 10 years ago at MIT. My research was fusing uh, precipitation data from six different satellites over CONUS, uh, over eight years of data. Uh, that was massive amount of data and I had to do everything on a local server. Uh, where was the data? On an FTP server behind the web. There was no API. Uh, you might be familiar with NOAA class, which is the comprehensive large array something system. Uh, I could request data through that, but there was a limit on the number of files. Uh, so I emailed them and said, hey, I'm a researcher, I'm doing this and that, can you increase my limit of files? I said, yeah, a factor of two, not more. Um, so I had to submit like 60 different requests. Uh, and for each of those requests, I would receive an FTP link that I would uh, download the data but I had to search each time myself. So limit the time uh, filter, limit the spatial filter, 
get the real, uh, the correct number of files so you can submit the request because if it is even one more than one, you can submit the request. It took me almost six months to get that data, put it in a server, process it from an orbital grid to a regular grid, match all the six different satellites. After six months, I could start uh, doing the actual uh, work of the, the modeling. So with that mindset, uh, I'm thinking, how can we do better? How can we come to a point that that, that process is much reduced? Uh, it is more benchmark. It is reproducible. I think that is also the factor that we don't talk about it much. In science, it's more talked about, which is a paper comes out, there's a lot of data being used, there's an algorithm being built. How can we make sure there's reproducibility there? And I think with, with data science and ML, uh, that's becoming more challenging because we can build models more easily probably compared to the physical uh, kind of uh, paradigm we had in the past. So we need to be more careful with that. That being said, uh, I'm going to say what is Radiant Earth before jumping into uh, what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so Radiant is a, is a nonprofit organization. It's a foundation established about three years ago. Uh, our mission is really focused on empowering users, uh, both as, as individuals and organizations, who are working uh, to use Earth observation data for global development challenges. Uh, we were funded originally by the Gates Foundation and OMIDR Network, and through the years we have uh, attracted more funding to do that. But that's really the key mission for us, to empower them through tools uh, that are uh, with a, a new focus we have recently, focused on machine learning applications. So you want to use Earth observation with machine learning on agriculture, on land cover, surface water, uh, socioeconomical impacts. How can we empower them to do better? And we do this through an ecosystem of work. But what is the motivation here? So this is eight different panels of agricultural practices at the global scale, uh, from US to Europe to Africa to East Asia to Australia and Latin America. Uh, spatially, you see a lot of patterns there, uh, diverse patterns. There's also farming practices that are different. Climate is different. Weather is different. The seed that is used is different. Uh, probably fertilizer application is different. If you want to build a machine learning model to uh, basically do a monitoring system on these, even a simple crop type mapping, nothing more. You need a training data that matches that diversity, right? We need to make sure there is diversity in the data that we are dealing with. Um, and that is, a, that is a lack in our community in terms of how can we do this better. Uh, a similar example of that goes to computer vision work, so where the data science comes from, right? Some of you might have heard about the ImageNet, which is the famous uh, labeled data sets of, of humans, uh, objects, animals, about uh, 1 million objects with bounding boxes across about 14 million images. And there's annual competitions that die, die, die. And that is deriving the innovation in that field because there's a benchmark. Everybody builds a model. They know the best of the basically uh, the year. And then next year, people come and do more innovation in that. How can we do similar stuff in the geospatial world? Thinking about the, the type of challenges that we have, the type of data that we have. We have a temporal dimension that the computer vision world typically don't have. The video have, uh, but the classical image net of the world don't have the, the temporal dimension. So some efforts are going on. You might have heard about Big EarthNet, uh, which is a training data set out of Sentinel-2. It contains about 600,000 images, patches of 120 by 120 pixels. So that is a very good effort but it's all over Europe. There's no other parts of the world in that data set. Let's, let's do better. SpaceNet is another consortium. You might have heard about that. There's a lot of good data, particularly from the uh, commercial imagery, uh, the digital globe, Maxor uh, data in there with uh, a lot of buildings and roads. It has more diversity. It's like six cities in different continents, but still we need to do better of that. So that's why we basically, to address these problems, lack of diversity, accessibility of data, interoperability of these data, and the ML readiness, we established what we call Radiant ML Hub, uh, which is basically a hub to share this data, make it easily discoverable and accessible, and benchmark and document it so users can easily trust the data. Um, the hub is really the key part of our work, but there's also a community element to that. It is not just Radiant doing this, we are doing this as a, as a community effort. Uh, we are not going to generate all the data. We are going to serve the data through a, an API, but the key part is really having the community uh, uh, engage in that process, and we are doing that actively. And partly also doing uh, education work, particularly with the user base that we have. Uh, I don't want to get to the details of this, but the whole architecture relies on a stack. So Mark mentioned the stack, which was an effort to start it, um, exactly two years ago in October in the state of the map in, in Boulder. Uh, and that's what's sitting behind Radian ML Hub, because we don't need to have all the data on our repository. It can sit anywhere. What we need is the stack catalog so users can easily discover the data. 
uh, and be able to serve it. Uh, so you saw the stack. Uh, I want to uh, close with, with an example why, again, this is important. Think about I'm group one. I'm doing a modeling on a problem. So I start generating my own training data. Uh, I do my own training. I do my own prediction, and then I have an inference I provide to the user. Uh, group two comes. Uh, they don't have access to my training data, so they do the same thing again from scratch. Uh, what happens at the end if a, a, a decision maker comes in, how can I compare the prediction one and two if they are based on different training data? Uh, the model performances are different. The, the ideal situation would be we have a benchmark in the beginning, so we can then compare and benchmark the models at the end. And that's what we are trying to get to that point. So uh, users can use similar uh, training data sets and show how different models are performing. And this is basically my dream four line of code. Uh, you import a library in Python, uh, which is the ML hub. You search on a uh, bounding box with a keyword like maze, I need crop data. And the next line, you load the data. Uh, you don't need to spend six months to get your data from an FTP and then uh, grid them and then uh, get to the line five of that. Uh, we will be there. I mean, we will be here uh, in about a month. You can get the data out. The Python won't be finalized by then. But basically, AGU is our target for release of the crop data we have from Africa. Uh, and then we have a land cover training data set coming up in February. And the Python package will be more in, in March, April timeframe. But it's all open source. And we would love to uh, have your feedback and engage more around that. Thank you. Thank you, Hamad. Uh, we have around, uh, George said, 30 minutes for q and I will kick off with one question, and then I will turn it over to the audience. My first question is, uh, uh, let me announce that I'm actually on the board of OGC, so that's where it's coming from. Where are standards helping you, and where do you see need for new standards? I mean, I think it's, uh, in terms of OGC standards, it's been very helpful that, um, yeah, I think sometime in the past people were doing, obviously each one had their own custom implementation of geofunctions. It's, so it's really great to have one standard that you can effectively adhere to. Uh, you know, one of the things I think we see is on the raster side, um, I'm sure you guys are working on this, but it's a little less specified and there's people with different implementations. Um, and so we would love to see more effort there because I think it's, uh, Critically important data type, particularly as all the satellite uh, data comes online. Uh, I think there are two aspects of the standard very critical for our work. One is the data catalog standard. So the stack effort. So one thing I want to mention before getting into that was there was a sprint last week that George and the OGC community was there to integrate stack as part of the OGC definition, particularly the API. So, so that's hopefully moving forward and we look forward to that integration. When the stack comes to 1.0, it will be more official. But what stack enabled was there was a problem. Uh, people were, the simplest task is you want to search for raster data. If you will go to five different data providers in the US, the big ones, even the, both government and commercials, you had to write five different API calls with different parameters to get those imagery. The simplest definition of cloud cover, someone was between zero and one, someone was between zero and hundred. So you need to make different changes for that. But the stack enables that you have a single API definition to find the data and then serve it back. So, and that has helped us with the ML Hub now because there is an extension for training data so we can have a catalog standard for training data easily discoverable. The second is on the actual data. Uh, I mean, the cog that Mark mentioned is very innovative in that sense. It's very helpful to serve the data easily, just get a chunk of data. The traditional raster data, not the satellite data, it's usually stored in HDF and net CDF. They are very good. They're uh, the perfect for kind of geospatial dimension, but they are not cloud friendly. HDF is getting there. Mark mentioned the, the S3 object thing. NetCDF has uh, improved as well. There is ZAR coming up in the new format. Uh, there's also XRA implementation of NetCDF in Python. We are getting there, but I think what would be helpful is more data being converted to those formats, more cloud native formats that would enable uh, streaming the data through the cloud. Okay, Caroline. I write standards. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren. Um, I guess. From, from my perspective, it's about making it really easy for people to go between these different platforms to kind of bring together these diverse sets of data and a diverse set of um, 
methods, models, algorithms that are coming from all over the place, the standards kind of allow that integration and, and that's crucial because people, we need people not to be stuck in one place. Cool, now uh, any questions from the audience? So Lauren, you mentioned the kind of the importance of making sure that models can be explained. And Haman, you talked about the difficulty decision makers face when they have you know, multiple models and they don't know how to make sense of them. I'd be interested in hearing from the panel kind of what you think we as a community can do to communicate what we do in ways that kind of maximizes the uptake of you know, the types of models that we're all building. Um, so I guess from, I think that on one hand, we have to put a lot of emphasis on our communication. I think it's really easy to, as people who are passionate, I'm, I'm assuming a large portion of us are passionate about the analytical methods. Um, and so it can be easy to kind of assume that that's where things live and die by how right it is and how powerful or sophisticated the algorithm is. But if we can't effectively communicate it to decision makers, then it doesn't matter if we do the best analysis that's ever been done in the history of the problem that we're trying to solve. If nobody can use it, then it, it really wasn't that useful. And so that, that work, I mean, one of the things in a lot of those, um, the Venn diagrams about what a data scientist is, I, the one that um, George showed earlier, I think is a is um, useful, but one of the ones I've seen that I really like about what makes the best data scientists is there ha there is a, an ability to tell stories that's inherent in what it means to be a data scientist. And it's why data science is sexy for kind of the first time ever right now is because there's this group of data scientists who are good at telling stories. And I think we have to embrace that. It can be easy to say, well, no, but if, if it's, if it's, um, that's kind of playing into what's sexy, but actually if we want the best analysis to be the one that's taken the most seriously, then we have to buy into the importance of storytelling. So I think that's a key piece. Uh, I can use an example to answer that. So there are a lot of applications now being built for agricultural applications using multispectral data. So they provide, for example, a recommendation app to the farmer based on the performance of the crop, what to do next. Uh, the farmer, gradually adopts that solution when they see the benefit over the course of one season or two season. But then that company, I've talked to many of them, both in US and outside US, they go and they say, okay, we wanna aggregate this information, provide the recommendation to the policymaker, to the extension office. But they don't accept that. And they say, okay, what do you present to them? What is the solution? They say, yeah, we say we have our square of 0.6. Uh, that doesn't help the policymaker, right? Because the policymaker, the typical way they do it is they do census, they have all of people on the ground, they see all of the papers, they know how the process has been evolved to come to the conclusion. They, they don't see that transparency in the model building in many cases and the benchmarking. I think these are the two keywords we have heard from the policy side. We also work with the World Bank team and the group that does the LSMS survey. It is really the benchmarking and the transparency from them to understand what is really going on behind this ML thing so we can trust it and then put it into our decision-making process. Thanks. Yeah, I think um, there's always going to be a tension between wanting the most powerful model and having a model that's more explainable or interpretable, right? And I think it's one of these things where people just have to know when it makes sense to get that additional degree of accuracy versus doing something simple like a regression or geo-weighted regression um, that has maximum explainability. Um, I'm a big believer in also in visualization in allowing people to tell these stories mm -hmm. in the sense of a lot of people use our platform both to actually just see the raw data and see, okay, is this actually, you know, garbage in, garbage out? Is this bad data? Is it the right data to put in? But also to actually interpret the model. So um, in one example, uh, one of our automakers we work with actually puts, takes their model, I think they're using XGBoost, and then basically feeds in every possible input so that they can see the shape of the output and then visualizes that and cross filters on that so they can see potential biases in the market, which could either be um, in the model, which could be inaccurate or could actually lead to legal issues for them. Um, I also think that seeing the data is really important in the sense of uh, another example, CPG, 
does all this deep modeling of what census block groups to target, what demographics, um, a bunch of, uh, you know, pretty heavy geospatial analytics. But at the end of the day, they won't make any decision about a campaign to run unless they see it because the model might still spit out, like, you should, this deodorant, you should go after this demographic, poor demographic, whatever it is. And it could just be that it's people in a certain region of the U.S., right? Um, so it's really important to have a human in the loop still and that can actually see the data in its full breadth and depth. To add to the, the machine learning model discussion, one of the things that um, I've been told is that the property graph uh, technology is actually really good for allowing you to record the internal steps in the machine learning, so why the machine learning worked. And that gives you a reviewable, auditable, at some low level, um, machine machine learning model. I, sorry, I, I also think it's really interesting. I think at the end of Dr. Gill's presentation about what's knowledge, that question you asked, which was really interesting to me, and I think it's particularly important when we get into AI because in a lot of cases there is this question, which is, are we actually gaining knowledge? because a prediction is not the same thing as knowledge. So um, I think framing what our questions are, it plays a really important role. If we go in, we're not even really sure what our question is, we get something out, but we, we haven't gained knowledge. I, I think there's, there's some value in stepping back and really thinking about and having our decision makers critical, have a critical eye towards what What's the difference between prediction and knowledge and how can we be comfortable in times where we're just going to have to be okay that it's a prediction and we haven't, that there isn't knowledge that comes from it? And when do we actually need there to be knowledge that comes from it? You have a question there? Um, I have a question about the ML Hub. So the data you have are for training and bench and benchmarking, right? Yes. Okay. So the data sets you have, they're they're stored on your <coughs> servers. So they're not like stored somewhere else, and then you go after them. The ones that we are generating ourselves are on our S3 bucket, AWS. I should appreciate their support. Uh, but there is also data that comes through partners. For example, we are working with Microsoft AI. They have the data coming from their own grantees. Those are sitting on Azure. They are not sitting on our own bucket, but they are served through the same API for the user. So as a user, when you come to ML Hub, you don't see what is going on behind the scene. The data is served through one API. Okay. Are there any sort of similar hubs or repositories for just geospatial data in general, you know, regardless of where it comes from? And, and so not necessarily that it's all stored in one spot or even just a few spots, but, um, you know, so there's a way to, to kind of say, well, I want data that, like, I love your little Python thing, you know, that says the very simple saying, this is what I want go forth and find it somehow uh, from whatever resource. I don't know if I'm making sense there, but. but I see your point, but uh, I think that the platforms that have been so far has been, they make a copy of the data on their repository to serve it. I mean, Google Earth Engine is a good example, right? You have a replicate of all the raster data from different satellites, climate model data on Google server, but when you go to Google Earth Engine, you get all the data. But because there's a replicate behind the scene, you don't get, for example, a copy from AWS. There's the open uh, data on AWS, the same thing. They have all the data there, and there's a stack API on those that Element 84 put it up. The Earth Search, I think it's the name, that search for all the data geospatial on AWS. But that, in practice, can do search on other dashboards as well if they are stacked. I think that the key part that we are able to do that is the stack definition that enables us to search any catalog if it is a stack, no matter where they are sitting. But I, I, on top of my head, I don't remember anything similar to that other than the data being replicated really behind the API. And we also work, we've got a team of folks that work on a project called the Living Atlas, which is kind of very similar in that it brings together a lot of data sets, uh, a mixture of raster, satellite imagery kind of stuff, but also lots of socioeconomic demographic infrastructure kind of data. And we kind of just act as the steward of that data. And largely it's data sets that 
the actual agencies or organizations that own that that authoritative data provide, we ma we make sure it kind of works together and is easily accessible to to anyone within the platform. So that, that's the Living Atlas, which is kind of our answer to that because it is we want to make it less than seventy percent of the time people spend on these analytical projects as much as we can. I can comment on that from a Maxar perspective. Uh, SpaceNet, I think I'm what somebody mentioned here. We one of the things we are doing is we're making the data open data. So the licensing is so you can actually do whatever you want to do. But um, the way I look at this is this is similar to face recognition, right? Uh, somebody created a database and took after 10 years when it actually the algorithm started working. I think that mentality is slowly coming around, but I don't think there's one common repository today. Yeah, so so I work for the federal government and Ed here also, <laughs> sorry, Ed, works for the federal government. And so one of the things I've you know, realized is, well, first of all, data, the data that we collect is a, is a public good. So I mean, it's out there because you know, we're, we're collecting it for the public, so it should be available as, as much as we can as long as we protect privacy and all that other stuff. But um, I've, I've just, it's really hard to know what data sets are out there. <laughs> You know, and so, um, and I know there's been efforts in the past, like data.gov and so forth, to kind of be sort of a hub, I guess, or uh, a clearing place, I don't know, for, for data sets like that. But um, it's just, I mean, because you're right, if you don't have the data, then you're, you're really going to have trouble building your models, unless it's physics-based models, maybe. But um, so I just think having something like that would be, would be very useful. So I just wondered if something like that exists, and I just don't know about it. But. Can, yeah, no, I, I think it's a big, I think it's a big thing and a problem right now. I mean, even if the data does exist and it's public, assuming people know where to find it, just a case in point, we've been working heavily for some time with census data, right? And yes, you get a census, data, you can get the tiger shape files, but then when you want to try to join that to the metadata, it's a laborious process. that's very convoluted with the way the data is split up between three or four different files. And so one of the things we've been working on is like, hey, we're work we have this data join, we've got the whole pipeline, let's open source that. Let's put it behind a, um, there's something called intake, which is like a Python open standard API for data cataloging. Um, and let's actually put that out there on the web for anybody to use in common formats. And so they can pull it in their Jupyter notebooks or whatever. That's obviously one small piece of things, but I'm just, even key data sets that people know what they are, sometimes they're very in inaccessible, you know, much less together in one place. I would recommend Harvard World Map. I don't know if the project is still that alive. Uh, Harvard, Harvard Center for yeah. Geographic Analysis. They have, um, still alive. We, they do a lot they're of really cool stuff. Right yeah. There's one more thing, we are at Google, so let's give a shout out to them. There's Google Dataset Search. So beyond the Google search, they started a project, I think maybe it knows more than me, maybe two years ago, that you can now search data sets, specifically search for data sets. But behind the scene, you need to have that data with a similar schema, so everything should be registered. So it's getting there, it's a, it's a gradual process, but that's another portal we can use. Okay, so uh, recently I uh, joined the uh, JTC1 and SC41 is artificial intelligence standardization organizations. And then recently we have some issues. What is AI data? So do you think the, there is a difference between the AI data and big data? If yes, how can we represent it of the AI data? For example, big data we can explain the characteristic of three V, v right? Volume and velocity. Um, <laughs> so Maybe I think if we can define of the certain you know characteristics of the AI data. So that is my question. I've really been looking forward to requirements from the the SC42 AI um, people. I've, I've I know something about what the big data working group has been doing, um, and to some extent the property graph work is coming out of some of the big data stuff, but. I really would like to see requirements. I will comment as the moderator. I think the line, the definition of AI, ML are blurred when we are talking about this. I think most of the time it's machine learning is what we're talking about. 
artificial intelligence from my definition is when the machines start making decisions for you or making some intelligence inferences, we are not even close to that for geospatial. Uh, I think we are all talking machine language right now. In that case, the data, uh, that's the reason why I was asking the question about uh, what is data versus knowledge. Um, there are schemes for representing knowledge as well. So for machine learning, that's how I look at it. Yeah, I think uh, uh, you see Berkeley professor once used a terminology called intelligent augmentation, IA, and he was like, what we have used ML for so far has been really augmenting human intelligence. We haven't really built artificial intelligence in that sense. So yes, we are really using machine learning, not artificial intelligence as a, as a bigger thing. In many cases, I think Radian does that as well. We use AI as a business term, but really in engineering data science term, we are using ML. There is no, there is no AI. What I would see AI data versus or ML data versus big data is the, the big data might be the more uh, kind of unstructured, unlabeled data that you might get. I mean, the term was also used a lot in the social uh, media kind of platforms. You just, you're, there are a lot of data coming in. They are not necessarily ready for ML, but there's data. So that is big data. But ML, you need really to have labels and inputs in a more structured way. Uh, I don't know, getting into technical train and test is fully. So it is a more uh, kind of, uh, I would say, higher level prepared data compared to just raw data coming in. That's how I look at it. I mean, another thing that that I would add is that really machine learning is just a, it's another way of solving problems. They're just a, it's really just a series of algorithms and tools. And so I don't know that there's a special kind of data, maybe since I've had three minutes to think about it, but the, off the cuff, what I think is, I don't know that there's a special kind of data. I mean, unless there's a special kind of data for all analysis, because I, I have a hard time with the idea that we're not just really just talking about analysis or now it's machine learning, now it's data science, who knows what we'll call it five years from now, but we've been doing this, which is trying to solve complex problems using tools. And so I think that all of the same kinds of, of rules about what kind of data we needed are there. Now there's some new kinds of data that are allowed in maybe that weren't allowed in before, um, but I think really it's about trying to solve problems that the, the framing the questions and that sort of thing are some of the bigger challenges. No, I, I have a question for, for Ahmed on, I have a question for Ahmed on our spatial, uh, not really. Um, actually, my question is related to this. So we, we, we have an ambition to build a imagery data set for spatial analysis, like you said, right? What we really want is not just the data, label data. So, I mean, uh, but label data tends to be very application specific, right? When what a label data looks like for identifying water bodies without, <laughs> holy cow. <laughs> That's an impact, yeah. That's I, it's a water bottle. It's an explosive <laughs> comment. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so one of the difficulties in building a spatial image repository is it's not as simple as um, ImageNet. ImageNet was like a very ambitious project. I'm not trying to minimize it, but it just with us identifying objects. Here is a chair, here is a dog, here is a car, right? Um, here you got to be able to say what you want to do with the application as well. It may still be a very good goal for this group, but we are nowhere close to that. No, I agree. Definitely, the the the, the type of data here is application or uh, vertical specific. So I, I can give you two examples how we targeted those. So we started with the land cover one, and I was like, okay, we don't want to be the organization to define a taxonomy for land cover. Like, I want to generate a global land cover training data, but I'm not in position of the land cover field is much older than my age, right? So I don't want to be in a position of defining that. So we hosted a workshop of experts on land cover and machine learning people. I said, okay, we are going to generate such a data. We are investing in that. We need your guidance. What should be the definition of that data? What should be the classes? What should be the granularity of the data? So we get community feedback to do that standardization. The other one was on agricultural data. So agriculture, you can do image annotation. You need to be on the ground, collect data, uh, field boundaries, potentially crop type, crop yield, some temporal information, when was the, for example, uh, planting, when was the harvesting, that data are then augmented with imagery to become the training data. Everybody who does that ground referencing does a different way. Uh, they have different standards. So one of the things we learned out of a one-year project we had was we need to develop a community standard about ground referencing. 
Uh, we drafted it actually two months ago. We took it with the CGIAR team, who is the uh, the big agriculture uh, group uh, with 15 different offices across the globe. We went to their big data convention. We had a session getting community feedback. Is this a good standard for doing this thing on the ground? Then we took it to Grand Challenges, even in, in Ethiopia. We had a discussion there. The next is a NASA workshop we have. Next is an ESA workshop we are going to have in April to get a community feedback. And how can we do better ground referencing specifically for ag data so we can have a better training data? We are hoping we can do more of that in domain specific, but it is it is an extensive process and we need to do that. Yes. Cool. Last two questions here. Because uh, again, I said I'm an engineer. George said 240, so I'm watching the clock here. <laughs> Yeah, I think this. I think this question is for Ahmed. I think um, it's about synthetic training data, and I'm curious uh, to what extent you are currently encouraging ingestion of synthetic training data. Number one, number two, why don't all the standards begin with synthetic training data, so that you can then move on to real and say this doesn't even serve the purpose of what we really need to ultimately do the analysis or achieve the. Uh, you know, the actual predictive behavior that we're looking for. I mean, personally, I like synthetic data. So the, the challenge, I think, has, as a community, we haven't invested much in the generation of synthetic data for training data applications. Particularly, we have a lot of imagery. Can we generate synthetic labels out of them so we can ingest them? We are investigating that. We are just getting into that process. We haven't invested in it in the past. But I haven't seen that much of effort in the community either. But if there is data, we, we are happy to, to ingest it. Because at the end of the day, it's a good catalog data. People will build on it, and there will be a lot of lesson learned out of it. But yeah, that, that's, that's the way of future we should try. Not that we should not do the ground referencing and labeling, but we should augment that so we can have more diverse data. Well, it's interesting because we work on building tools and we often start validating whatever we've built using synthetic data. And I can't tell you how often we're so excited about something that we've built based on that synthetic data. And then we throw it, throw real data at it and we, you know, have to take the rest of the day off and come back with clear heads because we're very disappointed. So I often wonder, it's like, why do we start here? Why do we keep doing this to ourselves? Because at the end of the day, it needs to work with real data. And, and it's messier and it's, it's, it, it doesn't meet these kind of, it, it doesn't fit into these neat buckets that, but of course it has to also work under the perfect condition. So, I don't know, it's, I guess it really is, it depends on the, the problem. Like we've been working on a time series forecasting uh, method and, you know, we create this synthetic data that makes sure that given this, nice set of this beautiful time series data sets where we've introduced noise and there's a, 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 a cycle that's obvious. It works perfectly. And then you throw real time series data at it, which is nothing like that synthetic data. And it's like, well, this doesn't work at all. And actually it's these really complex methods work beautifully on that synthetic data, but it's the simplest methods that do the best job on the really complex data. And so we end up, we got went down these very expensive roads and we end up back at methods that have been around for 25 years. All right, last yeah. question. So, um, so kind of going back to this question of data sets, and this is something that's really interesting, I think, to us at Cray because, um, you know, even like people doing real time work, like mission critical work, like weather, are also looking at, you know, where are these their availability of curated data sets for historical data. But a question I have to the people in the room and people on the panel is, how much has you know this community explored what was done in the astrophysics and astronomy community? Full disclosure, that's where I come from, mm -hmm. but. You know, there's a lot of, um, you know, work that there's certain things that are easier, certainly, to do um, with astrophysical data, but, you know, being able to use location, being able to use metadata that tells you how it was collected, when it was collected, having standardized timestamps, and so I'm just wondering, like, kind of, you know, how has that worked in the um, location data community? I can comment on one difference between astrophysics and our world, and that is the human aspect. And that makes everything harder because, uh, I mean, ag, I go back because that's my daily job now. Uh, think about ag. If it was in a non-human world, the patterns would be more defined, right? You would be able to explain them with your models or synthesize them more easily. But when you have the human factor in there, it makes it much more complex. We are learning through that. I think astrophysics has been very good in adopting a lot of these data science statistical approaches. 
I think this is my perspective, not uh, not the organizational one. A geospatial world is the way behind astrophysics in terms of adopting those. But we are getting there. The human aspect is just making it more challenging and also interesting at the same time. I guess I'd just say we hire a lot of bastards. <laughs> we actively seek those resumes. I'm very excited when I get one comes across my desk. So with, with that note, one of the things we are noticing is especially uh, geospatial conferences. Uh, Ten years ago, it used to be few of us talking to each other. Now we see a lot of practitioners here. Uh, which is very encouraging. I, uh, I was talking to somebody from health industry. We never used to have them five years ago. So bringing that expertise together basically makes it very valuable, which goes back to this uh, uh, session's title is about how do you prepare the data to actually do the analysis. Uh, based on what I hear is we still got a lot of work to do. Uh, but uh, it's encouraging that uh, with all the compute and other aspects we are looking at, we can actually make this happen to the next session is how do you analyze this data. With that, please join me in thanking the panelists and Dr. Gil Aspel. And George has few few instructions. All right, so um, this last portion of session two, what we're just finishing up and the like, is to encourage an active discussion at your tables. And so for the next half hour or so, uh, focused on your table, take a break if you need it, but come back. And so at uh, uh, three, a little after three, 305, 310, um, come back. Uh, and if a representative from your tables, uh, each, you know, you want to elect somebody or somebody has a, you know, a real specific thing, wanna, we'll invite um, each table if they want. Uh, to give, you know, just a comment as to what you discussed uh, from the group. If you haven't been heard, this is now the time to make that happen. So please talk at your table, take a break. We'll start up at 3, 305.